our second session on monetary policies. Uh, we will be presenting three papers. Uh, the first one is uh, Inflation Targeting and Exchange Rate Management in Less Developed Countries for uh, We Philippi. Then Forecasting and Monetary Policy Analysis in Low Income Countries, the Role of Money Targeting in Kenya for Rafael Portillo. And then the end, Reactions to Monetary Policy Regimes, uh, Inflation Targeting versus Flexible Board, which I'll be presenting it. Uh, therefore, I would let you start your first presentation. All right. Thank you so much. <clears throat> okay. Thank you for the opportunity to present this paper in this conference. This is joint work with Marco Araudo and Ed Buffy. I should also acknowledge um, financial support from DFID in this project and remind you that the views that I'm going to express today should not be attributed to the International Monetary Fund or DFID. So let me start by motivating the topic and saying that uh, to some extent there is a great deal of confusion about managing the exchange rate in countries that practice inflation targeting. Uh, conventional wisdom and, or, and theory usually advocate for letting the exchange rate float and um, in fact criticizes the frameworks in which the exchange rate is introduced in the interest rate rule, which is the instrument uh, that is usually used to practice inflation targeting, um, because by introducing the exchange rate in this interest rate rule, the theory can, may, um, says that you may create some confusion about what is the main objective of the central bank, what is the main target of the central bank. Uh, so in general, uh, theory and conventional wisdom uh, advocates for um, uh, not targeting the exchange rate uh, and letting it float. And in, in fact, there's part of the literature that uh, sees a flexible and market determining exchange rate as a precondition for successful uh, uh, inflation targeting adoption. On the other hand, um, policymakers seem to disagree with this. Uh, as we know, uh, there is a universal preference to manage carefully the exchange rate. And there is also empirical evidence that uh, foreign exchange market interventions are not only frequent, but also very large. So this difference between theory and practice uh, has motivated um, the development of new frameworks to study uh, inflation targeting. Two examples of this literature are the papers by Austria et al. and Venice et al. in which they, they basically make the point that, to some extent, this obsession of theory of studying whether the exchange rate should be introduced in the interest rate rule as another argument is sort of misplaced. Because in order to target the exchange rate, you have a second instrument that is basically foreign exchange market interventions. So in this case, you can have a framework in which you have two instruments, meaning the interest uh, rate and the uh, foreign exchange market inversions, and two targets the inflation rate and the uh, exchange rate. And to some extent, this should create any confusion or this, this will help with some of these criticisms that um, uh, uh, frameworks that have uh, introduced the exchange rate um, have suffered in the sense that uh, by having two rules and two instruments, it should be easy to explain to public, you know, that they, 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 what, clearly what the instruments are and the targets are. Okay. So, um, we acknowledge, you know, this, but we still believe that, you know, when you look at, the, at what countries do, we see sterilized reserve sales as an integral part of inflation targeting, as opposed to a separate policy instrument deployed to achieve a separate objective. So, what I'm trying to do here, and I will try to do here, is to present a framework in which there is some rationale for beneficial complementarity between interest rate rules and foreign exchange uh, market intervention rules from the perspective of the literature of macroeconomic instability, or uh, some people call this the determinacy uh, literature. So basically, we subscribe to this literature that claims that, um, let's say, a sensible rule is a rule that should avoid, at least, uh, inducing fluctuations that are driven by self-fulfilling expectations. It's a rule that should avoid indeterminacy issues. I will show you today that management of the exchange rate is highly conducive to a well-functioning inflation targeting regime. And I will do that in two steps. First, 
I will show you that in a flexible exchange rate system, inflation targeting incurs in a high risk of indeterminacy. Basically, it is more prone to induce this uh, self-fulfilling uh, expectation fluctuations in the economy. And then I will show you that by adding the second rule that um, to some extent targets the exchange rate, then having those two rules, a foreign exchange rate intervention um, rule and uh, interest rate rule, then that reduces uh, this risk of indeterminacy. Okay. Um, let me refresh your memory um, or tell you very briefly about what I mean in the context of new Keynesian models, because I'm, I'm going to be using a new Keynesian models. Um, uh, refresh your memory about what I mean by indeterminacy in these models and, and, and link it to the well celebrated Taylor principle. Um, So let's consider the, the closed economy canonical new Keynesian model in which we have three equations. The first question is the IS curve that relates consumption, consumption to the real interest rate, and the real interest rate is the difference between the nominal interest rate and inflation. Then there is a second equation that is the new Keynesian Phillips curve that is forward-looking that relates inflation to, loosely speaking, let's say, demand, consumption. And then there is a third equation that describes monetary policy in which here I'm going to consider a uh, forward-looking interest rate rule in which the central bank moves the nominal interest rate in response to expected future inflation. And here, this coefficient, phi, pi, will play an important role in the issue of indeterminacy. Let's consider this model and, 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 and let me show you how, if the central bank is not aggressive enough with respect to inflation, then you may induce this self-fulfilling uh, uh, expectation fluctuations. So imagine that, for instance, uh, people, for no reason, no fundamental reason, no productivity shock, no spending, government spending shock, they expect that inflation will go up. The government, the central bank, in response to that, will raise the nominal interest rate. But if the response coefficient of this rule is too low, below one, then what happens is that the real interest rate will go down. This will feed into demand, will stimulate demand, which in turn will force inflation to go up. So in the end, over time, expectations will be self-validated. What to do? Well, the solution in this literature, the determinacy literature, is apply the Taylor principle. The Taylor principle means you need to respond aggressively to inflation, so this coefficient needs to be bigger than one. Why? Because in that case, even if you have these expectations, the government will raise enough the nominal interest rate to make the real interest rate go up, control those demand pressures, and therefore inflation will go down. So there is no possibility in that case of this self-fulfilling um, expectation fluctuations. So what we do in this model is that we take a new Keynesian small open economy model with two goods, traded and untraded. We step, I, I, I won't go over all the equations because um, uh, of the lack of time, but, but today I, I, I want, still want to give you a sense of, of some of the key equations of the model. So we have sticky prices in the non-traded sector, and that then gives us a new Keynesian Phillips curve, in this case, for inflation of non-traded goods. And notice that in this case, it depends on aggregate consumption, but also in, on the real exchange rate. We also have consumers that maximize utility intertemporally, and from that, we can derive an IS curve, like the previous one I just showed you. But in this case, this inflation is actually the CPI inflation. So given that I have two goods, I have two different types of inflation. One is the traded um, good inflation, that in this case, after some simplifying assumptions, is equal to the depreciation rate, epsilon. And the other inflation is the non-traded inflation. So the CPI is going to be a weighted average of these two inflations, and alpha is that going to denote that weight on flexible price inflation, or traded inflation, let's say. Consumers have access to domestic bonds and foreign debt, and therefore, you know, we have a, what I call a modified uncovered interest parity condition that equalizes the returns on domestic bonds and the interest rate charge on, on foreign debt, and we have a premium that, to some extent, helps us to, you know, analyze different situations of, 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 of different degrees of, of, of openness of the capital account. And then, 
one of the important features of the model is to have currency substitution, as I will explain later. So we assume that consumers derive some utility from liquidity services of um, domestic currency and foreign currency. And that allows us to have then a foreign currency demand function. It's, it's quite complex, so I didn't uh, state it here explicitly. Here is it's, um, it's in a general form. What I want to point out is that you know, the demand for foreign currency depends on expected depreciation, future depreciation, and also on expected non-traded goods inflation. Monetary policy is described, as I said before, by a forward-looking interest rate rule, right? But in this case, inflation, remember, is going to be a weighted average of two inflations. But here I'm going to modify it slightly by saying, you know, I'm going to be more general and say, well, actually the measure of inflation that is in this rule is a weighted average, but these weights are going to be uh, denoted by omega, which, you know, embeds different uh, cases. When omega is equal to zero, is the case in which that inflation measure corresponds to the non-traded good inflation. When omega is equal to alpha, that's the case that we had before of, uh, of CPI inflation, right? And when omega is equal to one, then the rule responds to a measure of inflation that corresponds to the traded good inflation. For now, I'm going to assume uh, pure flow, and fiscal policy is going to be Ricardian. So basically, in the back of the model, you know, I assume that the the government has this instrument that ensures that the budget constraint of the government is always um, guaranteed. Um, okay, so let's, let me jump to the results. The first result, as I was mentioning, is considering the case of inflation targeting, which you have a forward-looking rule. And I will show you that in a pure flow, this inflation targeting framework incurs in a high risk of macroeconomic instability by inducing this self-fulfilling um, uh, expectation fluctuations. So here is a graph that kind of summarizes the results. What I did here was basically to calibrate uh, the model and uh, well, I, I, we won't have time to, to, to talk about um, the parametric calibration which, which is actually interesting but um, uh, and then I will consider you know the results in terms of varying uh, the response to uh, coefficient to inflation and also the weight on, on traded goods inflation, right? So I will plot here all those combinations of these two parameters for these particular rules for which we have either determinacy or indeterminacy. Indeterminacy is that part, remember, in which we have this self-fulfilling expectation fluctuation. So we have macroeconomic instability. Here, <coughs> here notice that, you know, just, just, just to remind you, if this weight is equal to zero, right, then along this y-axis, I will consider in the case in which inf the nominal interest rate only responds to non-traded inflation, right? If the weight is equal to omega, to, sorry, if the weight omega is equal to alpha, alpha is the weight, remember, of the CPI inflation. And let's say that in, in a lot of these uh, low-income countries, you know, alpha is about like, I don't know, a good estimate is 0.4, which replace, uh, which, you know, <coughs> reflects the share of food, you know, flexible price goods in, in CPI, right? And let's consider the, you know, the celebrated, um, uh, coefficient of, of the Taylor rule, that is 1.5, right? If I consider, you know, a rule that responds with that coefficient of 1.5 and a weight of 0 0.4, notice that that rule will give me indeterminacy, right? So notice also that this region of determinacy seems to be bounded by two, by two bounds, an upper bound and a lower bound, okay? So what is the intuition of these two bounds? Actually, it's in, in, in some, you know, it's, it's very difficult in two-sector models, and as you, you know, when you start putting features and more features in these models, it's very difficult to derive some some uh, intuition about the results. So I will try to to do my best here. The first uh, is what is the intuition about upper bound? Well, you know, it has. This is an old result to some extent uh, with Marco Micro Auto, with half a paper in which we show that in two-sector models. You know, if you have this specification of, of Taylor rules that uh, we were discussing, this rule is actually equivalent to a rule that responds to non-traded good inflation and responds negatively, negatively to uh, consumption. So, to some extent, it responds to excesses in, in, in demand in the wrong way, right? Because every time you have an excess of demand, this rule tells you that the central bank will actually reduce the interest rate instead of of, of, of raising it. And this will fuel some of these indeterminacy issues. For the lower bound, I just want to point out two effects. 
So let's, let's consider again this exercise of, of building one of these self-fulfilling equilibria. Right? And imagine that, for instance, you have um, expectations of, you know, people have expectations of a higher depreciation rate and also a higher uh, non-trading inflation rate. There are two effects. The first effect is an effect in which, you know, the government raises the nominal interest rate, of course, in response to these expectations. And then, because we allow for uh, the Taylor principle to hold, this front coefficient is greater than one, then the real interest rate goes up, which in turn, you know, makes consumption then go down, to which firms respond decreasing prices and therefore lowering inflation. However, there is a second effect that is driven by the fact that we have currency substitution in the model. And it's that in this case, when you have expectations of a higher uh, uh, depreciation and also a higher non trade good inflation, you will have an increase in foreign currency demand. And this foreign currency demand will be validated by uh, a spot depreciation, which in turn will translate into a higher real exchange rate, into a real exchange rate depreciation. By, by having that, you know, that will, sorry, let's go back to the specification of the, uh, sorry, let's go back to the specification of the new Keynesian Phillips curve. If you have a real, sorry, my apologies. Uh, sorry. If you have, if you have that, then by having a real exchange rate depreciation, that they will translate into higher inflation. So basically, you have these two opposite effects, right? And it is possible that the second effect may dominate, and in fact, you may have these indeterminacy problems. So what, what can we do? One possibility is to try to design a rule that gets into these linkages between um, depreciation and non-traded inflation, right? One possibility, as some of the literature does, is to include the exchange rate as a second argument of the interest rate rule. Here are the results. As you can see, they don't vary that much relative to the previous uh, slide, the previous figure I showed you. So it doesn't help. So that's what we call targeting the exchange rate the wrong way. A second possibility is to add a second rule. So besides having the uh, interest rate rule, we add a second rule that is a foreign exchange market um, um, intervention rule in which reserve accumulation responds to the depreciation rate. And in this case, as you can see, it really helped with this indeterminacy problem. As you can see, the lower bound is completely gone. And actually, the upper bound moves, moves up. So even if you do this exercise of, for instance, considering, as I showed you before, a rule that you know, responds with a coefficient of 1.5 to inflation and a rule that puts a weight on, on flexible, on traded good inflation of, of 0.4, in that case, you will see that the rule will induce uh, determinants. It will shield the economy against these uh, self-fulfilling uh, fluctuation problems. Okay, what is the intuition of that? Well, it's basically working through the second effect I, I described before, in the sense that, you know, by having these two rules, you know, I'm, I'm building a, a situation in which even if expectations of future depreciation and, and future uh, non-trade goods inflation go up and that increases the foreign demand, then I have a rule that, con that, that, that you know, breaks that channel between uh, higher foreign demand and spot depreciation, right? And so, if depreciation doesn't go up, then there is no real depreciation, and of course, then you won't have an impact on the um, non-trade goods inflation. So I basically, you know, kill that channel, right, by, by having that second rule. Uh, so the results also, you know, hold in extreme cases of, of, a, of a peg, right, uh, because the, the same logic applies. So right now, um, let me tell you a little bit about the extensions. Uh, in terms of the ex extensions, we have different extensions, some that apply to you know, other rules and some that apply to you know, modifying the model in, in different ways. So the results hold for you know, foreign exchange and intervention rules that target the real exchange rate. You know, we get similar results to the one I, I presented before. You still need to have these two rules. Um, they apply to some extent to rules that have some inertia, right? they, they, they have some lag, of the nominal interest rate uh, as an argument, and that respond to core inflation. They respond to non-trade goods inflation. And they also, you know, the results hold also in, in the case that you respond to, to output. And 
actually introducing rule of thumb consumers or imported uh, inputs make uh, the results uh, strong. So just to conclude, so um, well in less developed countries where foreign currency still competes with domestic currency, uh, a supply of, uh, of, of as a supplier of liquidity services, forward-looking interest inter in, sorry inflation targeting is prone to induce macroeconomic instability in the form of self-fulfilling prophecies. That's the first thing I show you. Then I show you that this uh, indeterminacy problem is especially acute in regimes that target basically the headline inflation that was this you know, weighted average of these two uh, rates of inflation. And then I show you that a second rule that manages the exchange rate can complement forward-looking inflation targeting and therefore it can help shield the uh, economy against instability problems. An important caveat of the analysis is of course that you know, uh, behind this model is that we assume that the government has sufficient reserves to engage in this foreign exchange um, uh, market intervention, right? But, but as you, we know, um, you know, there is a long history of, of, of crisis, uh, you know, in, in both emerging and, 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 and low-income countries, right? Um, because of speculative attacks in, the, in those markets. Okay, that's, that's it. Thank you. Thank you a lot for your presentation. Uh, I really enjoyed reading your paper. I think it's very interesting and nothing to add on. <laughs> I just have one thing. Uh, you added the, um, the output in your extension. Uh, I think that since the less developed countries have uh, a target of uh, growth, uh, and, uh, growth and economic development, I think that it's supposed to be mainly in your uh, your main model instead of the extension, that's it. And I will uh, let the rest uh, for the questions. Uh, I, I just have a quick question. Um, it seems to me that you are using two instruments for, for managing inflation. So you, monetary policy still has one objective, which is inflation. And so you're using two instruments to manage one objective. So now, of course, you are doing this for, you know, for instability reasons, but at the same time, from a welfare point of view, it may well be more beneficial for monetary policy to react aggressively rather than implementing another, another rule through exchange rate intervention. So how you would balance if you would like to, you know, give more like, um, you know, from a welfare point of view, would you prefer to have another uh, monetary policy rule in the form of exchange rate intervention, or would you prefer to move more aggressively, which also provide stability in your model. Okay, thank you. So, um, just to clarify, so we, we actually have these two rules in which we have two different targets, right? The rule, the interest rate rule targets inflation, and the foreign exchange uh, market um, intervention rule targets depreciation. One thing that didn't hear right, one thing that I didn't discuss here was the implications for um, welfare. Right? But to some extent, uh, one thing that I can tell you is that if those rules generate these self-fulfilling uh, expectations, then it's easy to create this equilibrium in which all the variables, including you know, inflation and output, are very volatile, and therefore that will translate into lower welfare. Right? In, in that case, I can still compare you know, these rules in terms of, of welfare and generate basically scenarios in which if you don't follow these set up of the two rules, you only have one inflation, what, sorry, one instrumental rule that is the, the typical interest rate rule, you will have um, uh, welfare reducing effects. So of course you're using a second instrument, right? So you could use the monetary policy. Is it, uh, so, you know, from our perspective it's not, because they, they I mean, the, the main point of the, as, as far as I understand, the literature, the main issue is having the exchange rate in the same group in December, which is the, the paper that I think uh, Ben's uh, Raphael and I have. The, the, the point that they make is, well, the issue is that you have a second instrument that you can always use, right? And you, can, you should be able to explain to people, right, in terms of communication, of effective inflation target communication, that you are using the interest rate to target, you know, inflation, and these foreign exchange uh, market intervention rules to target the depreciation. I mean, certainly we don't dwell into this of, of uh, credibility in this place, right? We don't, we don't explore this. Yeah. 
Yeah. So yeah. thank you. Paul. So thank you very much. Very interesting piece of work, and it sort of uh, it, it makes a lot of sense uh, to be able to use these uh, two instruments in the case where you've got a developing country where the capital account isn't completely open. But I guess that that sort of caveat is, is the, at the core of it, like this this idea of the Mendelian trilemma. So can you talk a little bit more about what exactly you've assumed with capital account openness? Uh, is are these sort of movements in foreign exchange reserves just trying to replicate what would be happening under an open capital account anyway? So you're introducing a sort of introducing a fizz in the Coca-Cola and taking it out again by sort of just trying to sort of replicate what would be happening under an open capital account. And uh, well, also, how, how does this capital account openness affect determinacy? And and what is what does partially open mean for for the capital account? Yeah, th thank you for for that question. Yeah, that that's a very good point too. <laughs> So um, originally, when we started this project, we had actually, a, you know, to some extent, a, a close capital account in the sense that we didn't have foreign debt, right? Uh, and after receiving some feedback, we introduced this controversy premium I just, you know, quickly mentioned during the presentation because that allowed us to basically analyze situations in which you can have, you know, accumulation of, of foreign debt and 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 calibrate different, you know have a spectrum of different degrees of capital account openness, right? So the results I show you here, you know, are valid, you know, for a wide range of, um, of, of this capital, degree of capital account openness. Um, uh, in, this, in these models, of course, and this is a, probably a, a, a you know, comment aside, but it's a very technical comment, but one of the issues of, of, of considering you know, a perfectly open capital account is that you, you get into this beautiful promise of this small open economy model. So you need to close this economy in some way, right? And that's what we did here, right? So I can, the bottom line is I can tell you the results still survive in the case of different degrees of capital account openness. Here, you know, the results I presented for a, a didn't go over the migration, but it's a semi, as a semi open capital account, right? What we need to do, and that's I take your point, is we, we need to be, uh, do a, a systematic study of how that exactly affects, you know, how these determinacy regions, uh, you know, um, change, you know, if they change dramatically, in the case, for instance, of considering that, you know, it's not completely, the capital account is not perfectly open, but it's, it's close, you know, uh, it's close uh, to that. Yeah. Sorry, and just to follow up, in, in do you think that these movements in foreign exchange reserves uh, are just sort of replicating what would happen under an open capital account anyway, or, or is there something else uh, in the model that they're, they're, they're doing beyond that? Um, so uh, are the movements uh, to sort of, movements in foreign exchange reserves to stabilize the, uh, the nominal exchange rate, uh, would, uh, is that just replicating what would happen under a co open capital account anyway, so that you sort of you're introducing a friction and then reversing it out again, or is there something uh, over and above that? No, I think it's the same. I think it, I think it, you know uh, because you, you still need you know in, in this framework you still need to have this you know foreign currency in order to deliver this, this, this uh, result. So and, and you know, the, the way to to avoid this you know how this exchange rate fluctuations into inflation, as I was saying, but finding how to put the link between depreciation and, 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 and inflation. So, I, and the, the way you basically put these, these interventions, right? In the extreme case, think about it. In the extreme case, we would like just you know, put a peg, right? That will kill the, the, that feedback mechanism. So, I, I have a question about um, uh, FX intervention that it. It, it seems that by introducing FX intervention in the model to avoid a certain type of self-fulfilling shock or the possibility of a self-fulfilling shock, you're also opening the door to another type of self-fulfilling shock, which is running out of reserves. So have you thought about, I know this is sort of future work, but have you thought about perhaps combining those two types of analysis? Because because then even having this additional instrument may not guard you against the first type of shock if you, if you risk running out of reserves. And so you may, you may end up in a situation that may not be all that different from 
I guess depending on the starting stock of, of, of reserves. Yeah, that's, yeah, thank you. That's a very good, good comment too. Yeah, we, we have thought about it, um, but let me qualify that, right? So, to some extent, if you, if you think uh, of the first generation models of bottom payment prices, a like Krugman, then I mentioned something in the presentation that kind of um, makes a point like, well, this will hold as long as you imagine that you know, the government always behaves. Meaning, you know, you have uh, instruments that basically will avoid these situations un of unsound monetary and fiscal forces. If you think about second, you know, generation models of balance of payment uh, crisis at Oswell, then that's your point. It, it is more difficult to deal with those. And one of the issues that um, we have is that we believe that in order to do that type of analysis, it's important to do some sort of non-linear analysis. And as you can see here, most of the analysis, all the analysis, is done by log linear analysis. Right? But it would be you know, an interesting you know, point to address in, in future work. Well, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, from my perception of the model, I want to uh, be very sure that the model does not value, I mean, does not um, contradict the theory of impossible trinity. Do you think that has been captured? Well, here we move away from the, from the, from the trinity, in the sense that, you know, uh, we're aware that if, if the capital account is fully open and you try to target, uh, it's not possible to target, you know, the interest rate and, and the exchange rate at the same time. Here, this is possible because we still have, you know, we close somehow the, the capital, you know, we have some we close, you know, the capital account somehow, right? Um, so it is, it is still possible to move away from this trilemma that, that you are mentioning, right? If, if we were, this is related to, 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 to Sam's question, well, what would happen if you are, you know, there is no having a completely open capital account? How important is it? Um, and as I, as I was saying, you know, we, we check for a, you know, some range of the degree of capital account open, but you know, we need to do a careful analysis of go to extremes and see how this resolve change. We need to do that. And there's this paper by Schmidt Grohe and Uribe um, where they say um, in small open economies with incomplete asset markets there is a consumption that follows a random walk, the net foreign asset position follows a random walk. Um, and then they conclude in this paper that there are different ways of getting around this issue, right? Which is, for example, an endogenous discount factor or different kinds of tricks, sort of. I'm not, you're not using any of these tricks here, I assume, right? So you have this, this indeterminacy problem that they get as well, no? No. I, well, well, sorry, I, I didn't go, uh, just to clarify, I didn't go over uh, the full specification of the model. But in fact, one of the ways that you have to talk to small open economies is exactly uh, you know, the, the risk, premium, risk premium function, you know, the hours sloping supply curve of funds, as, as they suggest in the paper. Okay. So the indeterminacy issue is not about, uh, you know, the indeterminacy issue here is, is, is not what you're mentioning. But okay, so you're pinning down the steady state by this right, exactly. So I will always give, you know, the steady state value of foreign debt in this model. Okay. It will be given exactly. Yeah, my question, please, <clears throat> Philip. Um, perhaps the, the first question should be, which LDCs did you consider? And the reason I ask this question is, um, I'll use an example. Say in Nigeria, sometimes FX interventions are actually precisely done to target inflation. How so? Okay, um, I'm trying to say in some countries, yeah. FX interventions are actually sometimes directed at inflation targeting. Okay, and this is why if you check the CPI basket of, say, a country like Nigeria, where 53% is actually food and um, beverages, um, that's the CPI basket, 53% is for food and non-alcoholic beverages, most of which are imported. So you have central banks of such countries like Nigeria 
worrying that if the currency depreciates over much, that would have passed through to inflation. Now, the purpose of the question is from our understanding, because the results you present suggest that as if, if you manipulate the interest rates that separate, and if you target FX interventions, you target depreciation of the currency, which suggests that they are somewhat mutually exclusive. And my question then is, what about the case that I just explained, where in fact FX interventions are precisely targeted at inflation targeting? Well, but, but I think what, what we try to make, I mean, relative to what you are saying exactly, um, what we're trying to do is exactly what you are saying, in the sense that, you know, we know that countries um, manage the exchange rate for different reasons. One possibility is exactly what you said. People may, may be, you know, concerned that a lot of these goods are important and therefore, uh, you know, having you know, this volatility or overshooting of the exchange rate may have an impact on, the, on that uh, traded inflation. The, the point what we're trying to make is that um, that's okay and we should acknowledge that, but we need to, need, we need to have a framework in which we kind of um, have these two simple rules that target these two different issues, right? And still in that framework, you know, the central bank will be able to control the situation in which, you know, if they're concerned that there is a, you know, an increase in oil, right, and this, there is a high pass through and this will fade into, you know, uh, some traded uh, goods, then uh, it will be able to control those fluctuations through foreign exchange market intervention. I don't know if that Thank you a lot. We'll go uh, to the next uh, presentation about money targeting in Kenya. Is this is the mic working? All right, um, so thank you for this uh, opportunity to present this paper in this conference. Uh, the paper that I will be presenting is called, actually it's slightly different than the topic in the, of the original name of the paper. The paper is now called Money Targeting in a Modern Forecasting and Policy Analysis System and Application to Kenya. This was written with uh, quite a lot of co-authors. Um, Andy Berg, who's here, uh, Armando, who's also here, uh, Michal Anderle, and myself, who are all from the IMF, and then Enrico Berkes, uh, who was at the IMF and is now at Northwestern, and Jan Dolcek, who was also at the IMF and is now at the uh, think tank in Prague called OG Research. So uh, let me just jump right into it. Uh, the motivation for this paper is an earlier paper that we worked on. Uh, which I will refer to as Anderle et al. 2013, in which we presented a model for forecasting and policy analysis in uh, low-income countries. Uh, this is part of a broader research and operational agenda that we have at the IMF to support central banks in uh, sub-Saharan Africa mainly as they modernize uh, their monetary policy frameworks. By modernize, I mean that as their frameworks become increasingly forward-looking, uh, a greater emphasis on inflation, uh, greater control over short-term interest rates to communicate the stance of policy, greater focus on communication uh, to signal where the central bank is headed. So this is part of a broader uh, uh, move that, that one observes very clearly in, in sub-Saharan Africa. 
And this uh, model that we presented in the earlier paper was meant to provide sort of a blueprint of what a model to support that type of, of forward-looking policy would look like in a sub-Saharan African country. This is drawing, of course, on a lot of the work that has been done in similar models for emerging markets and, and advanced economies. One of the issues that uh, this is not the topic of this paper, but that we focus on a lot there is, is the importance of food inflation and, and, and the relative price of food in inflation dynamics in Kenya. But more relevant for this particular presentation was that when we apply the model to Kenya, we were thinking of monetary policy as being best captured by an interest rate based rule. Uh, so with the idea of the rule being that if inflation, if expected inflation started to increase over the medium term, then real interest rates eventually had to go up to target, to bring back inflation back in line with, with the target. Uh, and something that was interesting about using such an interest rate based rule to understand the Kenyan case is that, as I will show here, uh, this shows the actual overnight interbank rate in Kenya, which is the blue line, versus the interest rate implied by, the, by a version of the Taylor rule that we had worked on in our model. And so there were two aspects to this issue. One is that, as you can see, there was a prolonged period in which actual interest rates were below uh, what was implied by the Taylor rule. And so the interpretation there is that monetary policy was quite accommodative. And by having such a benchmark, we can then make sense of the stance of policy and the contribution of monetary policy to inflation in Kenya. And then since 2011, the, the rule became increasingly a prescription for what the central bank needed to do. And in fact, that's pretty much what they ended up doing. In fact, even overshooting uh, the prescription of the model. So one thing that was, no that was notable though is that there was, we did not discuss almost at all the influence of monetary aggregates in the conduct of monetary policy. And so in practice, we were acknowledging that monetary policy, but that one could understand monetary policy in Kenya mainly by focusing on short-term interest rates and abstracting from everything else. But this is in stark contrast with the, the fact that the, the jury, the monetary policy framework in Kenya is a money targeting framework in which the central bank sets uh, operational targets on res reserve money, sets intermediate targets on broad money, uh, and this is not just specific to Kenya, this is true of many sub-Saharan African countries with some type of independent, uh, of some type of flexible exchange rate regime or, or managed. So we felt that that was a gap that we needed to address in our subsequent work and hence this is uh, what we do here. So what we do in this paper is that we extend the model in Anderle et al. to introduce a potential role for money targeting. Uh, our focus is mainly on a narrower aspect of money targeting, so reserve money, the choice of reserve money targets uh, and the adherence to those targets. And again, since we had looked at Kenya, we extended this to see if uh, introducing money targets into the analysis was relevant for the case of Kenya. So once you start to think about introducing money targets in what are essentially gap models or new Keynesian models of uh, of the monetary transmission mechanism, uh, the one question, first question that appears is how should we model money targets in this framework? And so I will talk a little bit about this. And second, having introduced money targets in this framework, can the broader framework of the forecasting and policy analysis system that we've developed before, can it help shed some new light on the typical analysis that is done with money targets? What are those analyses? Well, for example, how are money targets designed? Or if there's a money target miss, so if money is higher or lower than the money target, how should one interpret that, that miss? And more important, and, and in the case of Kenya, the key question is, are these money targets relevant for the Kenyan case? Do they help us understand something about monetary policy that we wouldn't, that, that we wouldn't learn just by looking at, at interest rates and the deviation from, from the Taylor rule? So what we did for the case of Kenya is that we focus on three things. And, and we hope, by the way, this is an application to Kenya, but we hope that this is of, of general interest for countries in which money targeting continues to be 
perhaps an important piece of the framework. First is, how should one think of the design of the target? Second is, once the target is designed, how should one think of the adherence to the target? So how should that be reflected in the modeling of monetary policy? And how should it be related to the interest rate policy of the central bank? This is quite important because central banks in Africa, although they're still setting targets for monetary aggregates, they also have operational targets for interest rates. In many cases, they have policy rates. Uh, so how to put all of this together into one framework? And as I said, since target misses are an important part of monetary policy analysis under money targeting, can we use this model then to provide a model-based interpretation of target misses? There are two additional exercises that I will not talk about today. One is to the extent that you can model various degrees of design of targets and various degrees of adherence to these targets, what does that imply for, and, and given that we have a model that we've calibrated to account for business cycle properties of Kenya, what would those rules imply for uh, the business cycle in Kenya? And there is an additional component, which is that these models are also meant for capturing the state of the economy, for inferring where the output gap is. And so once you introduce money in the framework, can you use money, the informational content of monetary aggregates, to now cast, or, or even, uh, yeah, to now cast GDP? We, we talk about that in the paper, but here I will skip that. So in terms of target design, so how did we proceed uh, in terms of modeling uh, money targets. So the idea, first of all, the key idea is that money targets are set in advance. In the model, they are set one quarter, uh, actually, yeah, one quarter ahead. In the reality is slightly more complicated because money targets are set at least six months in advance, sometimes a year in advance. And then we introduce a general rule for reserve money target setting. And this rule is gonna capture various ways in which you can think of money targets. One is simple Friedman type rules, that is say a constant value for this money target that does not change much over time. Or perhaps more interestingly, you can think of to the extent that you're setting your target ahead of time, you can think of these targets as forecasts of what money demand will be in the future. Uh, and then if you're forecasting money demand for the future, what are you assuming about the stance of policy once, uh, for, for, that, for that future? So these, you, would th you could think of as two extremes in terms of the money targeting rule. And uh, in the middle, the, the actual target rule could be somewhere in the middle and that could reflect uh, institutional constraints in the designs of the targets. For example, the fact that you're not going to immediately update, uh, update your information about what money demand may be in the future. And so your targets are gonna be sluggish in how they incorporate new information. One thing that was uh, interesting is that Having had this general rule, uh, there was a way to calibrate this rule based on empirical evidence, and in particular, evidence from a simple vector error correction model that combined it, money growth with uh, the growth of the money target. And so we used that evidence to calibrate our, our rule, and, and we found some interesting results. And this is not surprising, which is that the setting of targets in Kenya is consistent with money demand forecasting. So the central bank, when, when it sets the targets, it's trying to uh, use as much information as possible to have a sense of where money demand will be in the future. And so it pays a lot of attention to what are the expected fiscal flows, for example, that gives it a good sense of, of what money demand may be. More importantly, targets chase actual money and not the other way around. So for example, when there's a target miss, uh, so say broad money is higher than what you were targeting, what ends up happening in the case of Kenya is that you increase the growth rate of the target to catch up with the actual, uh, uh, the actual uh, money outcome. So that already tells you that it's not a sense of, of reserve money being very influenced by, by the target, but rather the other way around, that uh, the the central bank is playing catch up with the, with the actual. So this is a, an example of that. This is reserve money and the target uh, since 2007. So the first thing that you can see is that there are these prolonged periods of target misses. So target uh, misses are 
positive and they can stay positive or negative for a long period of time. Uh, so, for example, here in the first part of the sample, this is a period of uh, money being above the target. And then, uh, say, this is the period of the global financial crisis, money demand declines considerably, and uh, the, the targets are slow to reflect that, and so a, a, a negative money target miss opens up. And then again, uh, a period of expansion post uh, the crisis, where money grows faster than what was being targeted, and so you have a prolonged period of a positive uh, uh, money target miss. And notice that it gets to be quite big, it's almost about 10% of, of uh, the actual uh, reserve money. So this already is evidence that indeed money targets are not plain, are not a key concern of the central bank. Because they're very large, uh, and as I will show later, these targets, these gaps do not elicit any major response of, of the central bank. So this brings me to the issue of target adherence. Uh, what we mean in the model by target adherence are these systematic but possibly incomplete efforts by the central bank to try to hit these targets. And here, I think what, what is, is, is important is to understand that target adherence is always a policy choice, that the central bank is deciding on every quarter uh, how close should it try to hit the target. Uh, in practice, it is impossible to it is impossible to hit the target because that would imply too volatile um, uh, interest rates. And so this is why, for example, at the IMF, when we describe money targeters, we think of them more as flexible money targeters because they're constantly missing their, their targets. Now, even if you miss your target, you would think that perhaps if you're trying to systematically at least steer money towards the target, that that would have implications for your, the stance of policy. And so, in particular, when, uh, if money is above the target, you would raise interest rates above perhaps what would be suggested by a Taylor rule to be able to uh, push the target in that direction. But, again, another evidence that, we, that that is not the case is that when you compare the deviation that are in the model between uh, so the stance of policy, which as I said, is the difference between interest rates and the prescription of the Taylor rule. So this is this long period of policy accommodation that I mentioned earlier. Under, uh, analyzing the target misses do not give, does not give you much of a clue as to why there was this substantial accommodation. So for example, the, the period of policy accommodation coincides with negative money targets, in this money target misses. It also coincides with positive money target misses. When you have a substantial tightening of interest rates, uh, again, that coincides with money targets being above, sorry, with money being above the target. So again, the understanding the target misses does not help you really understand why monetary policy was tighter or looser. So that's another indication that these money targets are in the background and they're moving a lot for many different reasons, mainly having to do with errors in forecasting money demand. But there is little, um, little implication for monetary policy. And so in a sense that validates our initial approach, which is that to understand monetary policy, we can just focus on uh, interest rates. Finally, and this is perhaps uh, something that may be quite relevant for other central banks, is that when you're doing money targeting, um, you end up paying a lot of attention as to why you miss those targets. And you're always trying to infer, is it money demand? Is monetary policy too loose? Uh, what is the role of aggregate demand? Uh, but that is typically done in a very ad hoc way. And so it is very difficult to come up with a very quantitative assessment. So this model is, can be one way of coming up with that quantitative assessment. And so we, what we do is that we filter data through the model. That's what's called the data filtration exercise. And the model provides a model-based interpretation of what are the different shocks that account for the money target miss. And so this is the typical uh, graph that comes out of this. So the yellow line is one type of money demand shock. So it's a, it's a money demand shock that has very temporary effects on the demand for real money balances. And the orange is the shocks to the velocity, to the growth rate of velocity. So those have persistent effects on the growth rate of money demand. 
And what you see is that the model accounts for most of the movements in these money target misses to errors in money demand forecasting. And that's not surprising because money demand is very difficult to forecast the liquidity needs of the banking sector and, and so on. So at least in the case of Kenya, this analysis validates the fact that they're not paying much attention to money targets to begin with because the money target misses are not very informative about the things that the central bank, sometimes they are. So for example, here, the, the light blue and the darker blue, these are monetary policy shocks, demand shocks. So over this period, there is, these shocks are playing some role. But uh, overall, uh, money target miss is not that informative. So um, I think I'm out of time. Is that right? I don't have much time, so I could go on and on about uh, the model. Uh, I will just briefly, very briefly, get to how I, we model the money target. So I'm not specifying what the rule looks like, because it's a bit more complicated, but the setting of the money target has elements of money demand forecasting, as I mentioned, on the basis of T minus one information, potentially some sluggishness, potentially some very simple Friedman type rules, and potentially some role for money target misses. On the other hand, there is an interest rate, a Taylor rule, which serves as a good benchmark for assessing monetary policy. And the general specification of monetary policy allows for target misses to play a role. In the case of Kenya, though, we found that this coefficient was incredibly small, close to zero. But it could be that for other countries, that's not the case. Uh, so to conclude, no systematic role for money targets in monetary policy in Kenya. Uh, although they may have mattered in specific episodes. Uh, we believe that this framework could be relevant for other countries. The country that we have in mind is, for example, Tanzania, uh, where there is much more of a role for money targets. I didn't talk about this, but the greater adherence to targets or the greater rigidity of the targets, the more volatile the economy will be. And something that could be worth thinking about for the future is, can we use this framework to refine how we how central banks come up with money targets in the first place. Because this is a framework in which output, interest rates, exchange rate, uh, inflation, money are being jointly determined. And so you could imagine that this, uh, we could think of this framework to help build money targets in a way that is consistent to forward-looking monetary policies. And that perhaps may make then the interpretation of target misses more, more meaningful. But, that's all for today. Thank you. Okay, I prepared a couple of slides just to organize the discussion. Um, thank you. Let me start the discussion by citing this remark by Ben Bernanke in one of the OMC meetings in 2008 during the crisis. He said in one of the interventions, we have been debating around the table for quite a while what the right indicator of monetary policy is. Is it the federal funds rate? Is it some measure of financial stress? Or what is it? I think the only answer is that the right measure is contingent on a model. You have to have a model and a forecasting mechanism to think about where the interest rate is that best achieves your objectives. It was a very useful exercise to find out, at least to some extent, how the decline in the funds rate that we have put in place is motivated. So I think this, this remark actually uh, captures a lot of the essence of this very interesting and useful paper. I know the paper is not about the financial crisis, however, you know, it is a, a, an interesting paper and very useful, as I said, because it, it provides a very simple macroeconomic model that can be used for evaluation of country-specific factors. 
and shows some of the advantages of following this model-based approach to inform monetary policy, especially in low-income countries. Right? It shows you how to study the implications in particular of money targeting in these in this, uh, low-income countries. Um, if you are familiar with this literature of money targeting, I think uh, you will recognize that one of the important contributions is that it formalizes this idea of, of monetary target misses and their link to, mo uh, to policy stance in, 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 in low-income countries. As Andy, as sorry, Rafael was referring a minute ago, this is something that you know, in policy circles um, is done kind of in ad hoc way, right? There is no formalization, but as you can see, it would be very useful if e even in these policy discussions, um, we move you know, to the use of these models as the remark of, 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 of Ben Bernanke was showing. Um, one of the interesting result that I found, and is extremely thought-provoking, is that in Kenya, in particular, you know, when they apply the model to Kenya, there does not seem to be a systematic role for money targets in the conduct of monetary policy. So, of course, after you read this, you know, you start wondering, okay, what's the point of, you know, having then money, money uh, you know, a monetary targeting framework in this, in, in some of these countries, right? The paper is not going to give you an answer, but still it's, 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 it's thought-provoking, you know, and it's clearly one of the uh, considerations you should have when deciding, you know, which framework these countries should follow. And something that, you know, uh, Rafael didn't go in too much detail, but it's, it's in the paper, and I, I encourage you to read it, is that it also provides an assessment of the implication of target design and adherence for the economic cyclical properties of, uh, of Kenya, right? Um, he shows how, uh, you know, in the spectrum of different uh, target adherence, uh, monetary target adherence, you may have different implications for the volatility of output, inflation, real interest rate, interest rates, exchange rates, sorry, et cetera. So I'm going to raise two comments. And these comments are, you know, kind of unfair in the sense that these are difficult comments to address probably in this paper. So, uh, I, you know, I would just suggest them, you know, for future research. Uh, the paper has a lot right now, and it's a very rich paper uh, and powerful messages. Um, so the first comment is that, um, as I was discussing in, in my presentation, you know, inflation targeted frameworks seem to be silent about the exchange rate as a potential target, right? But we know that this is, in fact, a, a pervasive feature in many low-income countries, as I was mentioning, right? So the question is, is, is this part of the story, you know, that they have there about, you know, my target uh, uh, misses, right? Um, and if it is part of the story, the question is, you know, how should we model this systematic relationship, right? As if, if you remember in one of the questions that Rafael presented, this systematic relationship was uh, a, a, a relation between target misses and, 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 and monetary policy as described by, let's say, a, 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 an interest rate rule, right? So, loosely speaking. So, if we introduce, you know, exchange rate in the analysis, right, and if we have a second rule for that, you know, the question is how should we model these interactions, right, and how should we model this systematic relationship? It's not easy because, as we know, you know, this will involve, you know, interlinkages between money targets, foreign reserve accumulation, and even sterilization policies. And the truth is that we also know very little about how to model these sterilization policies, right? Um, okay. Um, the second point I want to make, um, this is, this is uh, related to something that, as I was saying before, Rafael just briefly mentioned, and it is you know, that it is very common in the literature to, to evaluate the advantages or disadvantages of these monetary uh, frameworks, meaning monetary targeting frameworks or, you know, inflation targeting frameworks using an interest rate rule, but just looking at, you know, what are the implications for the volatility of, of uh, output and, and inflation and other variables in the economy. And, and in, in, in particular, in, in, in low-income countries, right, policy markets in low-income countries, or the literature about, you know, policy in low-income countries, tend to have this view that, you know, when supply shocks dominate, then interest, uh, sorry, inflation targeting 
may actually uh, deliver lower inflation volatility, but at the cost of higher output volatility relative to monetary targeting frameworks, right? Uh, and they actually do kind of a similar exercise by looking, as I was saying, at these uh, volatilities of, of macroeconomic aggregates. But then I was thinking it would be useful actually for further research to start thinking about how to introduce the benchmark that they have, right, of, of target misses and, and different uh, monetary, target, uh, monetary target adherence in a, in a more micro-funded model in which you can do welfare analysis, right? Uh, and the reason of that is that when I was looking at the, you know, at some papers, if there are, you know, papers that do this or, um, you know, you, you, you find like in the literature, for instance, this paper by Gali and by Gali 2003, that uh, shows that in fact, you know, in inflation target frameworks that follow a Taylor rule, you know, it is actually true that they perform better than monetary, monetary target, uh, targeting frameworks in terms of welfare. Right? So there, are these, there seems to be this disconnection between the results of welfare analysis and looking at you know, the volatility of, 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 these, of, of these variables. And you know, coming up with you know, conclusions for you know, policy. Right? So I think more work needs to be done. Uh, not, of course, not necessarily what I'm saying is not, not for this paper, but in general, you know, in, the, in the literature about this. Um, and uh, that's pretty much it. I really enjoyed, you know, this paper, and 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 thank you for you know, the opportunity. Uh, so thanks very much. Really interesting paper. Um, so. When you sort of started off, I guess the first thing that I, uh, sorry, the first thing that I thought of was that um, a, money, um, a money targeting regime in a place like Kenya would seem like a bad idea uh, because of you know shocks to the velocity of money, uh, things around you know this mobile money and that sort of thing, and that's going back to Poole's old 1970s stuff uh, on you know whether or not shocks are hitting the ice or the LM curve, and that should determine what the uh, the monetary uh, monetary lever should be. But it sounds like from some of the results you put up at the end that that's not the case at all. It's not the shocks to the velocity of money that, that, that are the problem, it's shocks to money forecasting. So is that the right way to read that or? It's still the shocks. It's still the shocks to money demand, right? Shocks to velocity. It's just that by definition, those shocks are, they cannot be forecasted, right? That's what results in the, in the miss. One other thing would be, is there a role for, or would there be any scope to uh, putting a bigger role for the banking sector in your model so that you can talk more about the role of you know, banks in money creation and perhaps things like changes in, in prudential policy, uh, you know, lending standards, all that sort of thing that might help also uh, yeah, give, a, give a little bit more um, sort of detail around what's going on with uh, you know, money creation? Thank you very much, sir, for your presentation. It is a very interesting paper, uh, but I have uh, a kind of a suggestion which may be useful. I, I believe that one of the things affecting uh, developing economics that prevent them from uh, achieving their um, monetary policy objectives and targets uh, is the uh, influence. I mean, it, uh, is the external influence of uh, uh, larger economies, as it is said in the literature, for example, when the U.S. sneezes, uh, developing economies catch a code. So I think uh, this kind of a model may be more uh, you know, practically useful to small economies if uh, you know, uh, issues on how to manage the external shocks are captured in the model so that you know, uh, 
the external shocks will not be making the economies to check and you know uh, the policy makers deviating from their uh, the targets and so on um okay so maybe i can answer these these questions uh or your comments so thank you to felipe and, and to the participants for very good comments i think maybe one thing that I've, i i should have been clear about is that in general it's very difficult to find support for money targeting right and we're not we Part of this work is driven by the fact that at the IMF, we are trying to work with central banks in sub-Saharan Africa to, to help them as they modernize their policy frameworks. Uh, but indeed, it is quite difficult to find in these types of frameworks to find enough reasons to support money targeting. Um, and, and, and of course, this uh, exercise highlights some of those questions. In, in this particular case, the difficulty in, in uh, being able to forecast uh, uh, money demand. Uh, but there are other things as well, right? It's harder to communicate the stance of policy via money targets. So how can you, can, can financial markets understand that if money growth was two as opposed to 2.5, uh, does that mean that monetary policy is loose or tight? You know, clearly, for example, these examples here of, of the money target misses are incredibly uninformative about the stance of policy, right? And I think that's going to be a general finding in, when you apply this framework to other countries. Uh, there could be some other arguments. For example, if, if there is a, a concern with fiscal dominance, paying close attention to what's happening with the central bank balance sheet can, be, can tell you something about the extent of those pressures. It could also be that if there's limited capacity in the central bank and the central bank can just f sticking to uh, trying to hit the money target, at least can ensure that uh, you know, you're not prone to some of these uh, indeterminacies that Felipe was suggesting, which, what, which is what would happen if they control interest rates, but then they don't move interest rates in response to anything, right? So, so you could find some reasons, but it's true that in general, it, it's not that easy. Uh, part of what we're trying to do here is taking the frameworks as they are and see if there's a way of incorporating this discussion on money targeting into something that is slightly more constructive, which is the medium-term framework, the, uh, what's happening to interest rates, uh, and, and so on. I, I take Sam's point about, uh, you know, you can also model macroprudential policies. I think that's a general area in which there hasn't been enough work done for low-income countries. Um, I think partly because the emphasis has been on getting the first-order things right, you know, getting a clear handle on the policy framework. Uh, is it IT, uh, control of interest rates, clarifying what are the, the objectives. Uh, but I think once central banks get a better handle on that, clearly these issues of macroprudential policy will become more and more. Uh, important. Uh, one of the things that uh, Felipe mentioned, which is uh, the modeling of the exchange rate and perhaps the exchange rate management, clearly this is something very important. It's not something that we did here, partly because for the case of Kenya, there is no major evidence of you know, massive exchange rate management. It is certainly the case for other countries in East Africa, for example, Rwanda, and for those countries then the models have to be adjusted. And so, for example, you cannot have, uh, you have to tune down the impact of interest rate differentials on the exchange rate because you know that the central bank controls the exchange rate uh, or heavily manages the exchange rate anyways. But then once you're in that, in that world, you may also then need to keep track of, of reserves. Uh, there's a general challenge in these models of these overall are gap models. Once you introduce reserves, you introduce stocks that you need to keep track of. Uh, that's not that straightforward. And, and the last question, which is a very valid one, on the external influence of, of you know, the world economy on these countries, clearly that's a very big issue, but, but that is in these models. So these models have a foreign block where you keep track of uh, global developments, global interest rates, uh, and clearly when you try to apply them in central banks for forecasting, that is one of the key elements of, of how you go about constructing your, your medium-term forecast.
Um, I have a, a comment. I think um, one of the reasons that the central bank misses its monetary targets is because Kenya has gone through a couple of reforms and financial innovation is quite big right now. So, um, so that could um, be one of the reasons why we are seeing this happening. And even for the case of Uganda, we had something similar because we used to target monetary aggregates and then we realized that we had um, instability of the money demand and um, some of the reasons for that was, you know, financial innovation and that's why we moved to inflation targeting. So you might find that's probably one of the reasons. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> I'll be presenting your paper. Okay. It's on monetary policy's reaction to shocks in YMU, Ghana, and South Africa. It's co-written with Gilles Dufresneau or who's here with us today, Kimiko Sujimoto and Roman Wolf from Banque de France. Now, the aim of this paper is to examine two types of monetary policies in the sub-Saharan Africa, the inflation targeting in South Africa and Ghana in, in one hand, and the currency board in YMU in the other hand, in order to know how does each economy react to eliminate the negative impact uh, of a certain types of shock, and which monetary policy reacts better to shock uh, in terms of inflation, growth, and stability? Mainly because this zone has been hit by three major shocks since 2006. The food and oil prices crisis in 2006-2007, the effect of the emergence of the global financial crisis on their budget deficit, and the effect of the Great Recession on their budget, uh, uh, sorry, on their GDP growth. Therefore, we're going to look at uh, both monetary policy and we're going to try to compare, compare them. For instance, in inflation targeting for Ghana and South Africa, they both undertake a flexible inflation targeting, where they have in Ghana a fixed uh, target of 5%, as for South Africa, a more flexible one of 3 to 6%. At the same time, they manage the, post, uh, the path of the exchange rate, so in order to maintain uh, price stability and economic development and growth, they both use the in in instrument, sorry, the interest rate as their main instrument. To understand more how does uh, this monetary policy works, we're going to take a look on their macroeconomic variable mechanism. So as we said that their main instrument is their interest rule. So once the central bank sets the interest rule, uh, the interest rate, it will affect both the exchange rate level and the credit level. The credit level will affect, therefore, the demand and supply, which will affect the price level, which is inflation. At the same time, the demand and supply will affect the primary balance, which will remediate by increasing or decreasing their debt. Now for the currency board. For the YMU, the West African Monetary Union, uh, they have a unique currency, which is the CFA franc, and which is uh, pegged to the uh, euro. Their objective is to ensure price stability and main economic growth. The key element of their uh, monetary policy is the compte d'opération uh, that, <clears throat> that allows them to have an unlimited access to their foreign reserve. Their main instrument is the domestic asset. Also, to understand more how does their monetary policy works, we're going to take a look on their macroeconomic variable mechanism. So, as we said, they have a fixed exchange rate to the euro. Therefore, uh, their money stock is partially backed by the foreign asset and also by the domestic asset. So, to sterilize any effect on money stock, the central bank will set the domestic asset. And by domestic asset, we take into account the uh, the loan depository of uh, the banking sector in the central bank. Therefore, any increase of the domestic asset 
will affect the credit level, will increase the credit, and therefore demand and supply, and therefore inflation. At the same time, any increase in demand and supply will affect primary balance, which will remediate by debt. Also, we take into account uh, the Belasa Simelson effect that any, uh, any effect on primary violence might affect the real effective exchange rate. Now, once we have these two models and two mechanisms in our head, we need to translate them into models. We had two choices of models, the FPAS model and the, the DSGE model. The DSGE model is the macro model with micro foundation that uh, takes into account lots of uh, market specificities. And since uh, we were considering a database uh, very restricted, so we could not estimate the, the parameters and also to use the DSGE model. Therefore, we used the FPAS model, which is a macro model that have a relation that shows the relation of the aggregate uh, macroeconomic variables. Therefore, we extended the model, simulated and introduced shocks. Okay. So the basic FPAS model, as we said, is a four basic equation. It's an aggregate demand equation, a Phillips curve equation, an exchange rate equation, and a monetary policy rule. So what we did is we took into account the specificities of these countries. And therefore, uh, since these countries have uh, high debt, we took into account the government budget constraint. And by that, it's also the fiscal policy reaction. Uh, on the other hand, these uh, countries have high bank banking intermediation, and therefore they have lending conditions in the credit market. So we introduced the bank lending channel, which is also the credit gap channel. Now, for the monetary policy rule, we have introduced a Taylor rule with an objective of real exchange rate stabilization for Ghana and South Africa, and we have introduced a currency board rule for YME. To note, our, uh, our model is in deviation of its targeted value or its equilibrium. Therefore, in the aggregate demand, we can see that we have added the bank lending channel and the fiscal gap channel. The bank lending channel for the case of YMU, CT is the credit, credit level, and therefore it's affected by domestic asset ratio. It's positively affected by the domestic asset ratio. For the case of Ghana and South Africa, it, it's negatively uh, related with the interest rate level. As for the fiscal gap China, BT is our primary fiscal balance, uh, which is affected by debt, DT, aid, output, and term of trade uh, gains. Uh, we consider debt as endogenous and uh, it's governed by a standard dynamic debt ratio. For our monetary policy rule, as I said, in case of Ghana and South Africa, we used a Taylor rule and we added just the uh, target of stabilizing the real effective exchange rate. For the case of, of YMU, we considered the money stock, which is partially backed by foreign assets and domestic assets. FT is the foreign assets, assets are domestic assets. The monetary policy rule, therefore, is uh, to set the, the AT, which is the domestic asset ratio, which will be affected in one hand by the foreign assets level and by all the, uh, all the variable that might affect our demand supply, money demand supply, okay? So once we have translated uh, our monetary policy, mo policies into models, what we did is we calibrated each, uh, each model to replicate the economies and therefore, we simulated and introduced three shocks. The first shock is, is a negative demand shock, which can be like a recession. A positive, uh, the second one is a positive inflation shock, which can be like the, the price and the prices of food and oil, oil prices. Uh, a negative fiscal shock uh, can be like uh, the, the effect of the financial crisis on their G, uh, GDP growth. Uh, sorry, on their uh, primary fiscal balance. Okay. <laughs> uh, once we will introduce a shock uh, to each economy, we will compare the three economies and therefore the two monetary policies reaction by three criteria. The stabilizing effect. By stabilizing effect, we are, we are, uh, we are talking about the main instrument of the monetary policy if it did work or it did not work to absorb the negative impact of the shock. Uh, the second uh, criteria is the persistency of the shock, and, the, and by that, it's the length uh, that uh, the shock took uh, until the targeted uh, 
Okay. Until, until the, the targeted, until the variable went back to its steady state. Okay. <laughs> the third criteria is the variability or volatility. And by that, we are, we are comparing both fiscal policy and monetary policy's reaction. If both policies, uh, for instance, if both policies were increasing output, we are saying that uh, they have a high variability, that we have a high variability. If both policies uh, were, were, uh, were acting different, differently, for example, one is increasing output and the, the other one is decreasing output, therefore we have a low variability or volatility of the shock. <clears throat> now for our impulse response function, what interests us is the mechanism we get from them. Therefore, talking about the first shock, which is a negative demand shock. A negative demand shock will, uh, will decrease our output under its targeted level. Therefore, it will both decrease inflation and decrease our fiscal balance deficit. So in one hand, the monetary policy will react by decreasing the interest rate. Once the interest rate is decreased, the level of credit will increase and the exchange rate will depreciate until increasing output. But monetary policy alone will not bring back output to its targeted level. Therefore, the fiscal policy will react by increasing debt ratio, which will increase output to its targeted level. And so we can see that in this case, the case of Ghana and South Africa, therefore inflation targeting, uh, a negative demand shock will be remediated by both monetary policy and fiscal policy. Now, for the case of YME, a negative demand shock will decrease output under its targeted level and therefore decrease inflation and create a fiscal balance deficit. But now, for the, for the case of YME, a decrease in output means a decrease of money demand. Therefore, the central bank will, will react by decreasing the money supply. And to do so, it will decrease the domestic asset ratio. But that will not increase output at its targeted level, but, but will uh, decrease output furthermore. Therefore, the only remediation of this negative impact uh, is by the fiscal uh, policy's reaction, which will increase that ratio until the output gets back to its targeted level. Therefore, in YMU, the monetary policy did not uh, help uh, remediating the negative impact of a shock, uh, and the fiscal policy was enough. To sum up, uh, for inflation targeting, we have seen that uh, the, the instrument of the monetary policy worked well to absorb the negative impact and therefore it had a stabilizing effect, whether it was destabilizing effect for currency board. It had higher variability for inflation targeting than for currency board since both monetary policies were, were helping decreasing output. Whether it have lower variability for cur currency board and uh, for the persistency of the shock, it was higher in inflation targeting. Therefore, we cannot state if inflation targeting, the monetary policy of inflation targeting works better than the currency board since it has stabilizing effect but have higher, higher variability and higher persistency. So in this case, we cannot state which monetary policy reacts better to eliminate the shock. On the other hand, whenever we have a positive inflation of a shock, uh, we have an increase of inflation above its targeted level. So for the monetary policy's reaction of Ghana and South Africa, inflation targeting, the central bank will increase interest rate in order to decrease credit and exchange rate appreciation until we have a decrease in output and decrease in inflation uh, till its targeted level. Now, uh, it's obvious that a monetary policy's reaction was enough to absorb the negative shock of an inflation shock. But the decrease in output will affect the fiscal balance deficit, which will uh, be remediated by an increase in debt ratio and therefore a fiscal policy's reaction. As for the uh, YMU, now a positive inflation shock means an increase in inflation and means an increase of money demand. Therefore, the central bank will react by increasing money supply. To do so, it will increase domestic asset ratio and therefore it will increase output. So it does not uh, decrease inflation, but will increase it furthermore. Therefore, the monetary policy of YMU is not enough or does not absorb the negative impact of an inflation shock. 
Therefore, the only remediation of the shock will be by the contractionary fiscal policy, which will decrease debt ratio and output and therefore inflation. To sum up, so we can see that for inflation targeting, whenever we have a positive inflation shock, it has a stabilizing effect since the monetary policy worked well to absorb the negative impact, but have a destabilizing effect for currency board since the monetary policy did not work to absorb the negative impact. Also, for inflation targeting, it has low variability and low persistency of the shock. And therefore, in this case, we can see that monetary policy of inflation targeting, it's better to absorb the negative uh, impact than the currency board itself, which needs a contractionary fiscal policy. Now, for our last uh, uh, shock, which is a negative fiscal shock. The reaction of Ghana and South Africa, as well as YMU, will be the same, and it will be as follows. So whenever we have a negative fiscal shock, uh, we have a decrease in primary balance under its targeted level, which will increase output and debt ratio. This increase in output and increase in debt ratio will create inflation, will, uh, sorry, will increase inflation and increase as well the primary balance above its targeted value. So we'll have a surplus. And therefore, to remediate the surplus and to remediate the increase in inflation, the monetary policy will intervene in the case of Ghana and South Africa by the increase of interest rate, in the case of uh, YMU by the domestic asset, to, to decrease credit and therefore decrease output, and to have back the decrease of the fiscal balance to its targeted level. Therefore, in this type of shock, we can see... Ah, oh, sorry, this is the reaction of YMU. Okay. Therefore, in this type of uh, shock, uh, we can see that both monetary policy works well to absorb the negative impact of a fiscal shock with low variability and low persistency. To conclude, so in, in case of uh, negative demand shock, we can see that for Ghana, South Africa, and YMU, uh, none of them, not none of them, but we cannot state that one of these monetary policy reacted better than the other. Uh, for inflation uh, shock, we can see that Ghana and South Africa and therefore the inflation targeting framework works better uh, to absorb the neg negative impact of the shock. As for, the, for a fiscal shock, we can see that both monetary policy are good enough to absorb the negative impact. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. So, um, thank you, Fadia, for, for that presentation. The, uh, the paper uh, is very interesting. I, I enjoyed reading it and, and seeing the, the exposition. Um, my, my impression is that um, this is a, a, a fairly ambitious project in the sense that um, you and your co-authors are tackling a number of issues uh, that are relevant and that perhaps have not received uh, that much attention in this type of, of models or this modeling literature. Um, so you're paying a lot of attention to the interaction of monetary policy with fiscal policy, which is clearly important. And in particular, you're also trying to keep uh, track of some important stocks, you know, the stock of debt uh, and the consistency between stocks and flows. And that's something that in general FPAS models don't do and they just focus on the flows. Uh, you also um, are zooming into exchange rate management issues and how those may differ even across countries that are uh, so-called ITers. In the case, the distinction between, I think, I thought Ghana and South Africa was very, very relevant. And this goes back, of course, to, to Felipe's presentation and, and to his comments before. Uh, and another thing that I noticed that was different is this emphasis on credit conditions and this lending gap. Um, uh, and, and the difference between that and just a pure monetary and financial, real monetary conditions based, say, on, on just purely. Uh, so, I thought all of those were, were worthwhile extensions. Um, Perhaps I would have liked to um, see one of them at a time. Uh, for example, what happens if you turn the fiscal channel off and then you just can purely on the, on the monetary policy? Another comment I had is that 
for the modeling of credit conditions and this lending gap, I think for, for these impulse response functions, it can be very interesting. It can get a little trickier. Identifying the lending gap is between a country, say, transformation of its system as, as that may make the identification of the gap quite tricky. And perhaps in the end, you may have to go back to the real interest rate different, you know, to, to, to the real interest rate gap as a better measure of, of, of the stance of policy. One issue that I, I really caught my attention is that for the currency board, you have this. That what concerns credit is the availability of central bank funds. And I think that's very much kind of a money multiplier type story. My, my reading is that, you know, the concept of the multiplier is increasingly being questioned as being a relevant concept for money. I know that just came out in the Bank of England saying that the, av the availability of uh, reserves of central bank reserves is not the determinant of, of lending. The determinant of lending is uh, interest rate policy, the profitability of those uh, lending projects that are out there, uh, the, uh, the how how uh, the capital buffers of the bank. So, you know, this is an ongoing discussion. It, I think it's not settled, but I think it also has implications for how one should think about credit also in, in low income countries. Um, because then I noticed that by going this direction, you know, this modeling of AT, which is the domestic asset ratio, I, I, I felt that some of the findings were a bit counterintuitive. So, for example, sorry. for example, you have this finding that it, it seemed to me that losing reserves was expansionary. Because if you lose reserves, you're offsetting that by providing credit to the banking system. And if you're doing that, then you are loosening their constraint and therefore they're, they're lending more. That seems to be, to me, a, a bit counterintuitive because my understanding would be that if, if a currency board is losing reserves, monetary policy is tightening. Um, and, and, and I think you are really taking the interest rates out of the equation completely when you look at the currency boards. And I don't know the WEMU, but I wonder whether, you know, you, you do say that the discount rate in the WEMU is very closely related to the discount rate of, of the Banque de France. but or, or the Treasury, but is that really the relevant interest rate in, in the Waymo region, or is there, say, a money market rate that is giving a better sense of where the monetary policy stance is? Because it may be that there is an interest rate, and in fact, that interest rate is reflecting kind of these balance of payment issues, and, and, and that may then, the implications may be a bit different. Um, and uh, the, the last thing I'll mention, and then I'll, uh, we can open the floor for, for question, is I didn't see the link between the real exchange rate and inflation. Um, in, a, in, a, in a currency board or in a, in a hard peg, those two are very closely related because any change in the real exchange rate has to come from inflation. I mean, it could also be changes, say, if you're pegged to the euro and the euro dollar is changing, then that could also be a source of real exchange rate movements. But um, in, uh, this was a, a point that was made earlier today. In a peg, the inflation rate often reflects movements in the real exchange rate because the real exchange rate has to move in a certain direction because of BOP pressures. And so again, it wasn't clear to me exactly how that fits in your framework. So maybe that's you know for for future future work. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, I just want to confirm the kind of impulse response uh, functions you have adopted. I want to confirm the kind of impulse response functions you have used in your study. Is it orthogonized impulse response function or structural impulse response function or generalized impulse, res impulse response function? Because the kind of impulse response function you use will also affect your results. So what kind of impulse response function have you used? Autogonized. Autogonized, okay. You can uh, check the paper if you want for the... Uh, okay, autogonized. <laughs> okay. 
Uh, thank you for this clear presentation and so a so relevant subject. Uh, I'm just wondering because there is a so I mean there is an expanding or I would say uh, great evidence on the heterogeneity in women countries. So because there is a lot of papers say, uh, stating that, for example, uh, countries respond uh, asymmetrically to shocks, uh, whether they are supply or demand shocks. So how did you account for this heterogeneity in your model? Maybe I don't know if you have the conclusion you have drawn from the from your from your impulse responses are aggregated, or how did you uh, handle with this issue? Uh, another question, which comes like uh, a consequence of the first one, is that given that there are some asymmetric sh uh, asymmetric responses of two shocks, then for example, uh, fiscal policy could be uh, differently uh, decided at national levels. So how could you account for this type of responses into your model? Uh, first of all, we didn't take into account asymmetric shock. We are introducing the same shock for the three economies to see how they are uh, uh, reacting. And, uh, but as well, we have the term of trade, like uh, usually the asymmetric shock, will, it, it will be from the term of trade. So we have the variable in our, uh, if you want furthermore to extend the Thanks. I also thought it was a really interesting paper and I look forward to reading it. One thing I, I, I mean, you only have a small amount of time to present, but I was curious about what the impulse response functions to monetary policy shocks look like to get a, a bit more feel for, especially for the WAMU, which is more novel, how, how you're modeling monetary policy. I did get the feeling there might be some strange signs there, like maybe like Raphael was mentioning, whether, whether a, a tightening of monetary policy, what kind of effects it has through the economy. It'd be helpful to think about what that that is. Uh, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I just didn't. Uh, so I'm just saying, I'd like to see what a monetary policy shock does. A monetary policy shock? On its own, in the WAMU, as a way of understanding better the, the, the model. Ah, okay. In particular, the WAMU, because it's more unusual. Ah, okay. Thank you. So is it. Um, is one of the shocks you analyzed, um, you are looking at a negative inflationary shock, I guess, or positive, yeah, and, positive. and positive, and you said that this, is, um, this could be an example of a global food price or energy price shock. But we actually do observe global food and commodity price shocks, and we pretty much know about their dates, right? So it could be interesting to see, for example, what happened in a, in a period where we know that food and commodity price increase, how the performance of the monetary policy regimes in these three cases, you know, was to compare the performances in actual real time to what happened rather than the simulations that you have. Yeah, you're yeah, right. Thank you. Thank you very much. I just want to uh, say something in line with what I said earlier. Uh, it's a form of suggestion. Uh, I would like, I mean, I, was, I want to suggest that you try to use the generalized impulse response functions. I think uh, in the literature, that is relatively new compared to the orthogonized. It seems there are some defeats with the orthogonized uh, impulse response functions. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for your uh, suggestion. Okay, so thank you all for your questions and your attendance. <laughs>